Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 678 for January 28th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. All the beer aficionados, they all line up in front of the pot stills for the photograph. It's not in front of the brewery, right? So, so they are a thing of beauty for sure. For size, yeah. Um, only the best equipment. You can wash your face in the shine off those stills. <laughs> and I mean, it's, you know, beautiful in feature and form, yeah. Um, I mean, an absolute delight to look at. I think that's what I really love about the traditional copper pot stills. Three years ago this week, we introduced you to Graham McElhoney, a Scotsman with years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry and a dream of making his own whiskey. At the time, he was still trying to find a place to build his distillery in British Columbia. Now, Victoria Caledonian is a reality, along with Twa Dogs Brewery. We'll catch up with Graham McElhoney on this week's Whiskey Cast in depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department, all coming up on this week's Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique, but a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Let's update the top story from last time around. British Columbia's cracked down on four Scotch Malt Whiskey Society partner bars and the seizure of the Society's whiskies. British Columbia Attorney General David Eby told reporters Friday that changes may be needed in the province's liquor laws. Right now, those laws require bars and restaurants to buy all of their liquor directly from the province's liquor distribution branch, while the society whiskies are only available through two private liquor stores in Victoria and Vancouver. Those private retailers have to buy all of their inventory through the province as well, But if the buyers for the B.C. government's liquor stores choose not to stock a specific product, it's not legally available to bars and restaurants. EB has appointed an advisor to review the province's liquor laws and work with bar owners. But according to the CBC, he said, quote, It's an issue of law reform, and that law reform has not happened yet. Meaning no change in the current policy for now. We're starting to get the latest tourism numbers from around the whiskey world for 2017. The Kentucky Distillers Association announced this week that visitor traffic along the Kentucky Bourbon Trail grew by 12% during 2017 from 2016. That includes both the main Bourbon Trail and its 10 visitors' centers, along with the Craft Tour's 13 smaller distilleries. Nearly 1.2 million people stopped at the 23 distilleries last year, with visits to the large distilleries up by almost 6%. The craft tour was up by 43%, and Adam Johnson of the KDA credits a change in Kentucky state law that took effect last year for at least part of the growth. Being able to have cocktails now and have buy the drink has really been a big deal for us. We've seen that with our craft members adding more experiences Uh, Our heritage members are adding them as well. So I think that's what's uh, led to more visits, people staying longer, and also uh, wanting to come back if they've been before, because so many of these things are new. By the way, those numbers do not reflect visits to Sazerac's Buffalo Trace and 1792 Barton distilleries. Sazerac is not a member of the KDA, and its distilleries are not part of the Bourbon Trail. Buffalo Trace had an 18% gain in visitor traffic last year, breaking the 200,000 mark for the first time. Sazerac has not yet reported visitor numbers for the 1792 Barton Distillery in Bardstown. Over in Scotland, 
Diageo reported a 15% increase in visitors at its 12 distilleries that are open to the public, with more than 440,000 visitors. Kleinleash Distillery in Brora had the biggest year-over-year gains with more than 8,500 visitors for a 127% increase over 2016. The 12 Diageo Visitor Centers will be open for free on February 8th, 10th, and 11th as Diageo celebrates International Scotch Day. That's not all. Irish distilleries also reported a double-digit gain in visitors during 2017. The Irish Whiskey Association reports 814,000 people visited the 12 distillery visitor centers. That's up 11% from 2016. That number is likely to show a sharp gain in 2018, as several visitors centers that opened in the middle of 2017 report full-year numbers for the first time. That includes the revamped Jameson Distillery Bow Street and the new Pierce Lyons Distillery in Dublin, and as several more new distilleries open up around Ireland. Back to Kentucky now for a second. The KDA's Kentucky Bourbon Affair each June is one of the events that has helped boost tourism numbers along the Bourbon Trail. This year's Bourbon Affair is set for June 5th through the 10th, but tickets are expected to go on sale as early as this week. Adam Johnson of the KDA also coordinates those ticket sales. The reason we're kind of uh, nebulous about it is it kind of depends on our golden ticket stuff. we got to get those knocked out first because they kind of get priority over tickets. That's part of the, the uh, advantage of getting a golden ticket. So once we get them squared away, flip the switch and uh, buy all the cart all you need. When will the golden tickets go on sale? Well, we're shooting for probably Tuesday or Wednesday next week. And that, that, that's a scoop for you. So hopefully we can... Uh, that is, a, as you can imagine, a very, very busy 48 hours for us. And once we get those guys squared away, uh, we flip the switch there. So I, I anticipate late next week. Keep an eye on the Bourbon Affairs social media timelines and its website this week for more details. We have a link to the website on our calendar of events page at whiskeycast.com. And one more note out of Bourbon Country. Last September's inaugural Bourbon and Beyond Festival in Louisville that combines bourbon and music was a success. So much so that the promoters have signed a deal with the city to hold the festival at Champions Park each year for the next 10 years. This year's festival will be on September 22nd and 23rd. In other news, plans for Edinburgh's first malt whiskey distillery in almost a century are coming along well. Local officials have already granted planning permission for the project, which will see the old engine shed site turned into a distillery and visitor's center. While longtime Scotch whiskey veteran David Robertson has been the face of the project so far, Canadians Kelly and Rob Carpenter have been the force behind it. They also own the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society chapter in Canada, and in between phone calls the other day with lawyers on the British Columbia issue, Rob Carpenter gave me an update on the distillery. The project is, is from our perspective, shovel-ready. We're already submitting for building warrants from the city. As you said, we've got planning permission. The one thing we need to finish up is our fundraise, and we feel we are in a very good position to get that done at uh, by the end of March. What are you still looking to accomplish? Do you, are you still just trying to get all the I's dotted, the T's crossed, and everything for the on the paperwork? Pretty much. Uh, you know, that takes a bit of time. Uh, it takes a bit of, you know, we've got a number of private investors involved, so it just takes uh, some time to, to corral everybody and, you know, make sure the money's in, the legal documentation's done. Uh, so, you know, we're in that process from our perspective. Um, and we should be getting on with construction in April, May, and opening about a year later. We're very excited. How did you guys get involved with this? Because I didn't know for the first year or so that you two were involved in it. Well, I had a day job to protect at the time, but uh, I, I get bored easily, and, and this has always been something I've been interested in. David Robertson and I have talked about doing projects for years and have worked on a few things over the last 10 years, honestly. And and then just the, the idea of doing this in the center of Edinburgh uh, capturing all those tourists, which is terrific for the brand um, awareness and uh, not to mention cash flow is, you know, just makes so much sense. 
So we're, we're really excited that it's come along so, so well. We'll keep you updated as work moves ahead on that project. On that note, the owners of the John Crabby Scotch Whiskey brand have submitted an application for planning approval to build their own distillery in Edinburgh's Granton neighborhood. Halewood International is also relaunching the John Crabby brand next month with new 8- and 30-year-old single malts from undisclosed distilleries. John Crabby was best known as a whiskey blender back in the day, but Halewood Managing Director David Brown wants to focus the brand on single malts at first. This week, the Wall Street Journal sent whiskey lovers on the Internet into orbit with a report that Diageo had been secretly plotting to challenge hundreds of years of Scotch whiskey tradition with some ideas that pushed the envelope a bit. One of those ideas was to use tequila casks in finishing, while another was to create what Diageo's internal documents acquired by the journal called a Scotch whiskey infusion category for flavored or low-alcohol blends bottled below the legal minimum for whiskey of 40% ABV. Let's clear up a couple of things. One, there is nothing in the UK or European laws that would ban the use of ex-tequila casks in finishing. Those laws only specify that oak casks have to be used and don't impose any restrictions on what they might have been used for before. However, the journal reported that Scotch Whiskey Association Legal Affairs Director Alan Park rejected the tequila barrel idea. While not giving the actual reason, the SWA usually rejects ideas like that on the grounds that something is not part of the traditional practice of making Scotch whiskey. We also need to make it clear that the SWA does not have any actual enforcement power over the industry. While it has a lot of sway, the only thing it could do would be to bring a lawsuit challenging the practice as a violation of UK and European laws and let a judge rule on it. While Diageo would not make anyone available for an interview, they did pass along this response via email, and I'm quoting now, Scotch is the most important category for Diageo, and we have an unwavering commitment to the integrity, long-term success, history, and tradition of the category. As champions of Scotch, we are always looking at ways to innovate to both protect and secure the future success of the category. In doing so, we work with the Scotch Whiskey Association on a range of ideas that seek to strike a balance between tradition and innovation in a way that ensures consumers get the great products they want. We will never compromise on the quality and integrity of Scotch. The Journal's article also cited Eden Mill Distillery in St. Andrews, where founder Paul Miller says the SWA rejected his idea to use chocolate malt in distilling his whiskey back in 2016. Once again, let's do some clarification that the journal neglected to mention. Chocolate malt does not have any chocolate in it. That's the term given to malted barley that has been roasted during the drying process. And in this case, chocolate refers to the dark brown color, though the roasting does bring out some additional flavors. Scotch whiskey distillers have been using chocolate malt for many years, with Glenmorangie Signet being one of the prime examples. In that case, it's used along with regular malted barley, and not all on its own. You have to keep in mind that most Scotch whiskey makers who want to try something unusual generally do reach out to the Scotch Whiskey Association first for advice, but once again, the SWA is not the final interpreter of the laws on Scotch whiskey. And speaking of Glenmorangie, we're getting the first look this week at this year's private edition release. Spios is Scots Gaelic for spice, and the whiskey is matured in American Oak X Rye whiskey casks. More details are coming soon. No word yet on pricing. If you're into video games, 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of the Final Fantasy game franchise. The game's producers have teamed up with Japan's Shinanoya retailer to offer a special 30th anniversary whiskey to mark the occasion. It's a 30-year-old Glenfarclas single cask that would appear from the label to be an official distillery bottling, 
But I have to note that when I contacted George Grant of Glen Farkless to find out more, he didn't know anything about this one. Pre-orders are available online from Sheena Noya at $330 a bottle. You may hear online about another rare Kuruazawa bottling that's hit the market. Poland's Wealth Solutions has bottled a cask of 51-year-old Kuruazawa from 1964 that is said to be the oldest Kuruazawa single malt ever bottled. The announcement came this week. Only 48 bottles were produced, and every single one of them was sold in advance to Wealth Solutions clients. No word on pricing. There are two other Kuruazawa bottlings that are more widely available, but not by much. The Whiskey Exchange in London is following up on last year's release of the two Golden Geisha Kuruazawas with two Emerald Geishas, a 33-year-old sherry cask and a 35-year-old bourbon cask. 170 bottles of the 33-year-old and 265 bottles of the 35-year-old will be available through an online lottery that ends on February 4th. Both will sell for £3,750 each. That's around $5,300 U.S. And finally, we bring you the story of Jack Reynolds, and we should all age as gracefully as Jack has. He's 105 years old, and according to Metro News in the U.K., just went rappelling from the ceiling of a warehouse, because he could. And last year he set a world record for being the oldest person ever to ride a roller coaster. Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, his daughter Jane told Metro that Jack puts whiskey in his tea every morning, and has two shots of the famous grouse in a glass with lemonade every night. He also makes sure that his family members have a dram when they have a cold, and said, that's his medicine, and it's not done him bad. Slotcha, Jack. And since I've been fighting a cold this week, after flying home from British Columbia, I think I'll take Jack's advice. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. Now, you've probably tried the Highland Park core range, the 10, 12, and 18-year-old single malts, along with Valkyrie, Magnus, Full Volume, and their other regional offerings. But if you're traveling, make sure you take a close look in the duty-free shop. For instance, the World of Whiskey's shop in Edinburgh's airport will debut a new 14-year-old Highland Park single cask edition this Wednesday. It's from a refill sherry butt, bottled at 59.9% ABV, and will sell for 129 pounds. That's about $183 a bottle, and you'll only find it at Edinburgh Airport. Of course, you can find out more about it at highlandparkwhiskey.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion... Why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded, and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. The latest episode of the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast is out now. We gathered this month's panel the other night in Victoria at the end of the Victoria Whiskey Festival and they tasted an eclectic flight of whiskies, the Bernheim Wheat Whiskey from Kentucky, Penderin's Madeira Finish from Wales, the Glenglassock Revival Single Malt from Scotland, and Nika's Coffee Malt from Japan. You can download the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from, and of course at whiskeycast.com. The Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel is brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, 
It's brought to you by Lot 40. The outcry over last week's seizure of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys from four British Columbia bars went global over the last few days as word of the raids spread. As we've reported, the whiskeys were seized because the bars sourced them through privately run liquor stores in British Columbia instead of the province's own liquor distribution branch, even though those private stores had to order them through the province in the first place. Andre Girard of Quebec posted this on our Facebook page. The whiskey wasn't illegal when it was time to pay the taxes to the government. Spencer Jacobson posted, Sad news about the raids. I hope someone gets to finish those bottles because the tax was paid. Daryl Fitzgerald posted this note. Liquor laws so outdated for today's society in Canada was in Italy and asked to have a case of good wine shipped and was told by the winery that Canada is the only country in the world they will not and cannot ship to. Really, greedy provincial governments get taxes on each bottle sold. They should just waive the bottle purchase taxes by the bars and have the tax collected at the bars. We'll certainly induce a much broader choice of booze that bars can offer. The government buyers have no balls or imagination when it particularly comes to good single malt whiskey. Would benefit all. From Europe, Marguerite Marie posted this. What a nightmare. Government-controlled stores sounds so much like East Germany in the 80s. It's hard to believe that such things can happen in a modern liberal society. And Whiskey Daddy at Jotterface on Twitter posted this. I think this could be resolved by opening up the government system to more suppliers. With more choice, less temptation to go to the secondary market. Also, probably difficult to ascertain whether tax has indeed been paid. In the UK, we have these stamps to prove it. And he included a photo of the bright red UK tax stamps that go on the back of each bottle sold in the UK. Let's move on to other stuff now. From Instagram, Janine in Portland at Whiskey.Wonders posted this on our new WhiskeyCast tasting panel episode just listened to yesterday. That group had some of the best flavor notes. Everything sounded delicious. Thanks, Janine. And Andrew Tyler Higgs posted this note on Instagram. One of my favorite things about long runs is eating whatever I want afterwards. My friends wanted to watch UNC versus NC State today in college basketball, so I mapped a run to end at Buffalo Wild Wings. Thank God for Whiskey Cast to keep me company for an hour and a half of running. That's week four of 20. 20% 20 done in terms of days, but only 13.8% done in terms of miles. Many more streets and paths and trails of Ann Arbor will be seen before training is done. Hashtag Ann Arbor Marathon, hashtag training fuel. Andrew, I'm glad we could help, and good luck with your marathon training. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. If you'd like to hear your comments on the show, you can record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And, of course, you'll always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events. The Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's U.S. chapter will have a Burns on the Beach party this Wednesday night, January 31st in Miami, Florida. The Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh, Scotland will hold its fourth and final Spirit of Speyside dramming session on February 2nd. Bonhams will have its first whiskey auction of the year in Hong Kong on the 2nd as well. The Kosher Food and Wine Experience is February 5th in New York City and on the 7th in Los Angeles. The Highlander Whiskey Festival is on the 9th and 10th in Alkmaar, the Netherlands, along with the Zagreb Whiskey Festival in Zagreb, Croatia. Right now, we have 191 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com, and we're adding new events all the time. 
If you have a festival or a whiskey tasting that you'd like to let whiskey lovers know about, just use the contact form at our website and let us know about it. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Three years ago this week, we introduced you to Graham Macaloni. He's been around fermentation and distillation his entire career, though it was in the pharmaceutical industry instead of whiskey. But it seems almost predestined for a Scotsman with that background to wind up making whiskey. And three years ago, Graham was chasing funding and a site to build his dream distillery in Victoria, British Columbia, when he sat down with me. But because I'm an entrepreneur, and entrepreneurs take risks, and are used to juggling multiple balls and being a jack of all trades, um, you've got a high tolerance for progressing multiple agendas in parallel. You don't have a place yet, do you? <laughs> so so uh, the scuttlebuck on that is we're going to be in, the, the target is downtown Victoria. For a lot of entrepreneurs, this story might well have wound up in failure. But Victoria Caledonian Distillery and Twa Dogs Brewery opened in the fall of 2016. Not in the downtown area where he wanted it, but in an industrial park on Victoria's north side. And with the help of retired Diageo master distiller Mike Nicholson and the late Dr. Jim Swan, Graham McElhoney is finally in the whiskey business. Last time we talked, about I think maybe three years ago, you were still looking at trying to build in the swimming pool downtown. That didn't happen, did it? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, we spent um, a, a good long while uh, trying to identify a downtown location. Um, one, of, one of them was out at the cruise ship terminal and they were going to build a building and I said, look, it's going to take too long because I've raised my money and I've got to get to market. And then we were looking at the, the swimming pool, the Crystal Garden swimming pool. And, um, and then actually it turned out that we won an open competition to move in there. But, and we were fully transparent about the commercial terms we were seeking. However, when it came to closing the deal, um, uh, uh, we couldn't come to acceptable commercial terms. And, the, and my advisors um, said to me, Graham, take a walk. Uh, you can't do this deal anymore. So we found this location out here. It's about 15, 12 to 15 minutes from downtown. Uh, it's on the main highway, so it's got good access. Uh, all the tourists are going up and down past this location. And, um, and we've had a very good first year uh, in terms of the tourism aspect because that was the main reason for being downtown was to access the tourists that are coming here for the whiskey festival or, or for beer festivals or whatever. But it actually probably worked out better for you because you've got more room to work with out here than you would have had in the Crystal Gardens site. Uh, that's a very astute observation, yes. Um, uh, uh, I mean, because we are away from downtown, you know, the square footage rates are, are much more uh, um, commercially viable out here. So, because we have a 17,000 square foot facility, um, and that adds up pretty darn quickly um, when you're paying dollars per square foot. And if that had been downtown, I think it, it could really have presented extreme fiscal challenges for us as a pure startup that's trying to build up revenues to become profitable. You also started with the brewery as well, with the Twa Dogs uh, Brewery, in addition to the distilling side of things. Let's talk about the brewery first because uh, well, whiskey starts out as beer. Yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, talking as a biochemical engineer and fermentation scientist, I mean, technically speaking, whiskey, I mean, this sounds like an, an anathema to whiskey connoisseurs, but simplistically put, whiskey is really just double distilled, unhopped pale ale. Um, so, so when you're making whiskey, you've actually put together a brewery. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, 
again, you know, having worked with Dr. Jim Swan, bless his heart, passed away recently, um, and uh, master distiller Mike Nicholson for you know 18 different Diageo distilleries. On the beer side, we've brought quality people in there. I know enough to be dangerous, and I'm a great connoisseur of all of these products, but I want to surround myself with great people. So we brought on uh, Dean McLeod, an Aussie, a Kiwi, uh, who's worked in about a dozen breweries, and then a young lassie, a girl uh, head brewer, Nicole McLean, who came out of uh, Brewdog in Scotland to join our Twa Dogs brand here in, in, in Canada. So our beers are called Twa Dogs Beers. I prefer to think of it as uh Whiskey is what beer wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> so, so <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that one. I mean, I mean, because you know, as a connoisseur of both products, um, we 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 actually, I think the way I would articulate it is, come for a tour, right? And our tour guides, um, um, our tour guides. Uh, will happily explain the nuances and the differences between how you make beer, how you make whiskey, the flavor notes, etc. And one of the things we love to have fun with on the tour is to explain that kind of front end, whiskey is not particularly sophisticated compared with beer making, right? Because at, at the back end of whiskey making, you've got the distillation that can clean up a lot. And then of course, you've, if you put it into good wood and, and you get a decent spirit, you're gonna bring that along. But the brewer, the brewer has nothing to hide behind. The brewer is fully exposed with the quality of his malt, the quality of the yeast, the way he does his fermentation. That appears unadulterated in that final craft beer, and he has to get it perfect. So. I should point out that while you were talking, Mike Nicholson came through the door, walked over here, saw us talking, and immediately turned around and took off. Graham went out and drug him back in. Mike, tell me about this distillery and how it compares to the 18 or so that you uh, ran over in Scotland at one point or another during your career, because I thought you were retired from this stuff and just doing consulting, and he drags you back in. Well, it doesn't have a cleaning agent. That's why I'm holding a big brush at the moment. It makes it singularly different from every other distillery I've worked in. Apparently, I'm a consultant and a cleaning lady. There's no extra cleaning lady money, needless to say. Well, there's no extra money for anything around here yet because you guys haven't made a profit yet. That's right. The problem is it's more Scottish than I am. <laughs> but how does the distillery compare in terms of the spirit, what you're producing here? Sure. Um, the spirit is, oh, I don't know, hard to say. Um, this is my second uh, supervision of making malt-style whiskey in Canada, and I'm pretty impressed, to be honest with you. Um, nobody, no matter how in depth my survey has seemingly had a b bad word to say about it. I did try the uh, Machnabreich uh, 11 month old version. Help with the pronunciation there, That's what he pronounced it as. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> but something along those lines. Hell, I'm, I don't speak Gaelic, so give me a break here. <laughs> Carry on. Okay, let's get the pronunciation right. How is it, Scotsman? Machnabreich. I can't say that without hocking up a lung here, guys. I'm sorry. I'm not meant for those kind of words. Come on, with a name like Gillespie, you should be able to. Hey, my ancestors got run out of uh, Scotland and Ireland because they couldn't pronounce it properly <laughs> generations ago. You've got, you got to get a bit guttural about it. So let's talk about that spirit because it tastes a lot older than it is. It's only 11 months old, the stuff I tasted. Sure. Some of that's obviously from the cask because this was a Jim Swan created cask yep. type. But tell me about the spirit. Yeah, well, people think, uh, as a general rule, that maturation is all about the cask. Um, it'll only work properly if you've considered the kind of spirit that you put into the cask in the first place. And the trick is the matching of the two, dependent on your um, selected outcome or preferred outcome. Uh, so it's not just about what kind of fancy barrel we use or what kind of treatment it's had. If you're not putting the right style of whiskey into that cask, then it's not going to, to work out the way you anticipated. So what makes this spirit unique? With the, Let's talk about the spirit that you produce that goes into those casks. Sure, sure. Uh, well, it's kind of carefully made. Uh, I would hope so. Mike's been worrying about it quite a lot. <laughs> it is uh, nice and light and fruity which is a very good whiskey to uh, contemplating maturing quickly. 
and it's sort of designed for that early three to five years, right? Yeah, if you've got um, a heavier complex spirit, it just physically takes longer. There's no way, two ways about it. There ain't no shortcuts. So why start with that? Why not start with something that has a reputation for maturing quickly? And then lean on Dr. Swan and his expertise to get the job done. Is there any difference between Canadian barley and Scottish barley in terms of how it distills? Yeah. Well, most of the barley that's made in Canada is brewer's malt. So yes is the answer to your question. Um, malt is made specifically for distilling under different processing parameters for again a different outcome from a brewer. It's not that you can't use brewer's malt, um, but the brewer's malt will not have any of the kind of heavy greenness that you get with a traditionally made Scottish malted barley. But that might be alright, because who knows what Canadian malt whiskey is supposed to taste like. So are you, are you using local grown malt or are you bringing it in from Scotland? Yeah, no, it's all BC malt that we're, we're sourcing, and so it's Meredith variety of, of barley. At what point do you think you can bottle it as whiskey? Obviously, you've got to wait the minimum three years, but uh, with grain that's designed in conjunction with the cask, what point do you think this is going to be ready to go on the market? So, um, you know, with, with due reverence to, to great people like Mike Nicholson and, and Dr. Swan, we've been tentatively moving forward with when should we do this? Because, you know, at one point, Dr. Swan had said to me, Graham, in the past I've gotten product ready to bottle in three years. For you, because I'm getting better each time I do it, we'll have it in two years. And I was really quite surprised and shocked by that statement from a, a, a modest man, right? He's, he wasn't a brash man, right? right. Um, um, but here we are just over a year into the exercise and because so many whiskey connoisseurs have come in and tried it and said, oh, I'd like to buy a bottle now, uh, we've started bottling it just in our visitor center as a trial and the sales have been going exceptionally well. Um, so that's kind of emboldened us to, to think, okay, you know, we don't want to diminish the, the quality standard that we're trying to accomplish by going to market too soon. But, but certainly, you know, people have been very, very, have received it exceptionally well. So. And you sell it as spirit instead of uh, whiskey? Yeah, single, so we call it single malt spirit. Yeah. Um, and and Magna Bracha uh, actually means son of malt. So it's a kind of a euphemism for, for immature whiskey. Where do you take this spirit in the future going forward uh, in terms of cask styles, in terms of uh, playing with it to uh, come up with some different flavors and come up with more than just the one whiskey over the time, Mike? Um, well, my job as a distiller is to make the whiskey the same all the time, so the big variable is casks. So, you know, once upon a time in the old country, American wood and sherry wood, that was it. You know, things are different now, and there's no end to the technical uh, to, the, to the number of spirits, uh, empty casts that you could use to s modify the flavor of the final matured product. What are you going to play with, Graham? So, um, well, there's, there's, there's two aspects to that. Um, uh, one is uh, the variety of wood that we've got. Um, we've brought in probably 10 different woods at this point. And it's been fun working with cask owners. We have a cask ownership program where people can, you know, uh, sort of design their own cask, if you will. And um, so that's allowing us to observe how the spirit does perform with these different woods. You know, whether it's sweet wine, Moscatel, uh, Port, Sherry, Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez, um, Ex Isla, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Madeira, et cetera. Of course, bourbon, uh, first use bourbon and virgin wood. Um, our, our De Rigueur as well, um, in addition to Jim Swan's STR casks, the Richard Bariques, Red Wine Bariques. Um, so we have all those different woods that we're allowed to have, you know, we can have fun with our cask owners and, and the spirit's working lovely with, with, with pretty much all of the wood. Um, in addition, to, and so as we really start to see how does the maturation process really dial in with the spirit, um, which ones will we really focus on in the future right, for our core offerings? You know, it's easy to put out some limited offerings here, but which ones will we dial in that are really, truly, spectacularly complementing our, our spirit? The STR that you've tried clearly is doing that. 
Um, uh, my early indica- my early thoughts, I think Mike's early thoughts are the Moscatel Sweet White Wine is really starting to do that, so probably place an order for more of that wood. Um, and of course, bourbon's always classic. Bourbon wood's always classic. Um, so we'll see how the other wines go. You know, the Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso will not take a wee bit longer because they're butts, they're 500 liter butts, right? Um, so that's on the wood side. Um, on the on the spirit side, this campaign, uh, this year's campaign, we're going to look at introducing a peated process. Uh, um, and uh, so thus far it's been unpeated and so we'll have some fun playing with uh, different peating levels um, uh, uh, this year as well and we'll, we'll take that further in future years. I'd love to explore the, down the road the concept of terroir and maybe different types of peat bogs but as a manufacturer first things first keep it simple stupid and let's start off with just one style of peat and dial that in and make sure we're doing an excellent process with that and then we'll take it from there. The distillery and brewery sit behind the wall of the visitor's center and bar with a glass door separating the two. So it's funny, even when we do a beer tour, all the beer tour, you know, these, these um, uh, the specialized beer tour companies, all the, all the beer aficionados, they all line up in front of the pot stills for the photograph, it's not in front of the brewery, right? So, so they are a thing of beauty for sure. For size, yeah, um, only the best equipment. You could wash your face in the shine off those stills. <laughs> and I mean, it's, you know, beautiful in feature and form, yeah. Um, I mean, an absolute delight to look at. I think that's what I really love about the traditional copper pot stills. They're beautiful to look at, but in my opinion, call me biased, in my opinion, uh, it's only these traditional stills that create a great single malt spirit. Um, I've tasted spirit come out of some of these other, um, you know, sort of German type stills, so to speak, right? Uh, or stills that have got a few plates in them, etc. And in theory, you would think that they would, they would give you an ability to control the spirit to your design. But quite frankly, I don't think it generates the same quality of single malt spirit. Tell me about the shape on these stills because it's uh, fairly narrow on the bottom, tapers up, and then a line arm at a little bit of an angle. Yeah, um, we, we we wanted, uh, and also slightly taller than your typical for size design. We were going to go taller again, and then we kind of um, we didn't the earlier conversation about um, location, 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 and we weren't sure. Uh, exactly how much headroom we'd have and I had to shorten the height a wee bit because um, I was looking to get um, a, a more refined fruitier spirit and copper contact is absolutely critical for that. So these stills are, are designed with being a wee bit higher. Um, the declining line arm gives you a bit more control, you know, once it's over, it's over. Um, um, and you'll notice that the, the condensers, um, or as an engineer we call it, a shell and tube heat exchanger, you'll see that the, the lacquering has only um, deepened in colour at the top end of the, the condenser. Um, and that's, you know, that's a sign of a well-run pot still that the bottom half of it or more is still um, undarkened. That means it stayed cool. And so that is a sign that we are capturing all of those lightest, fruitiest volatiles that are coming over. The fact that that lacquer hasn't changed color there. How much uh, spirit are you producing a year now? Um, not a lot, to be honest. Um, we're going to crank up the campaign this year. Um, you know, it's like, I think it's a classic case of any startup distillery. Um, uh, you know, your capital expenditures are a huge drain on your, your cash reserves, a massive drain. Um, and, and even as a project manager with detailed quotes and whatnot, we still had some areas of cost overrun. Um, and we had designed our business plan to have the beer um, create cash flow because the fresher the beer, the better it is. As soon as you make it, you're selling it. Um, but um, ironically, um, there's also been some government changes in this province that are actually stymieing the growth of the beer industry. Um, no. <laughs> what do they do to the beer side of things? We know what they've done to whiskey. Um, on the beer side, I, I mean, BC, British Columbia has been a, a great market um, for beer over the last few years. 
um, and uh, and, uh, and and paper it still continues to be a high growth sector from a customer demand perspective. However, the government stores uh, control the vast majority of volume of beer sales, even though there's a good number of private stores. The government stores have the bigger stores in the better locations and it means their beer turnover dominates. Maybe 40% of beer turnover is controlled by 25 government stores and five privates, for example, right? Um, and what unfortunately the government have turned around and done in this last year is um, they've decided to bring in uh, a retail style approach to centralise buying. So our sales reps cannot go in and sell an individual store on the quality of our product or the service. Um, it's now headquarters that will determine what beer gets listed and what doesn't. And at this point, they're telling crafty brewers like us, they'll only give you one listing if you're lucky, maybe two. Um, whereas our historic competitors or the big boys might have 10, 20, 30, 40 SKUs listed. Um, so, so it's really stymied our ability to grow in a growing market by not getting access to those key outlets. And so that's unfortunately forced us to slow down our whiskey programme. Um, now, sitting down with the, with the advisory team and senior management, we've, our, you know, we've come to the conclusion our whiskey is so fantastic. I mean, you, you've, you've rated it yourself, Mark, and thank you for that. Um, it's so fantastic, the board has said, Graham, you can't beat around the bush here, right? Go raise a wee bit more money, right? Sell a few more cast futures, all that kind of stuff, so that you can pump a lot more money into laying down a lot more whiskey. Um, you can't wait for your beer sales to pick up. We've gone into Alberta with the beer sales. Uh, we may go into Ontario and we'll continue to work with the province of BC to get them to take additional listings. So the beer will come along, it's growing well and it will come along, um, but it's not going to generate the cash as fast as we would have hoped. Um, and so going into Alberta and Ontario will help increase the growth. Um, and then, of course, going out and raising a wee bit more money, like most startups end up having to do, raise a wee bit more money so that we can lay down a lot more whiskey stocks. So let's look at the rest of the place. We're overlooking all the pallets of beer in the middle and then your uh, fermenters and your mash tons, right? Yeah, uh, just where the, the tour is going on at the moment, um, uh, a semi louter mash tun. Uh, it's got a steel's masher on top. Steel's masher allows you to pre mix uh, the, the grist, uh, the, the, the milled malted barley, um, together with the, the, the hot water so that you have a very precise strike temperature. So you're pre-mixing those before it even goes into the mash tun and that allows a high degree of reproducibility um, for uh, the creation of your wort. Uh, we're looking to create a nice clean wort um, is our style. Um, and so we do take a bit more time just to make sure that we're getting good filtration through the, 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 the grist bed and, and the mash tun. Um, like any traditional Scottish process, we're doing single malt whiskey and with, with you know, our, sub, our tagline is traditionally made by Scots, right? Um, you know, I'm a Scot from my accent. Mike Nicholson we talked to earlier, obviously Scottish, and then, you know, the, the legendary Dr. Jim Swan was Scottish too. And so we chose to follow a traditional Scottish process. So from there, um, you know, it's, it's basically um, uh, the raw uh, wort is going straight into the fermenter. We use a Lalamand M yeast uh, to inoculate. It's a dry yeast, and um, uh, we'll run it for, for about 70 odd hours. Uh, get it nice and fruity, and then transfer over an eight percent, an eight percent wash um, over to the wash still. So our charge in the wash still is five thousand liters. Um, typical process again takes it up to twenty five percent ABV, um, and then when you charge the spirit still, you'll charge that twenty five percent low wines into the spirit still together with the four shots and faints from the previous batch, um, up to about forty percent ABV charge in the spirit still. That's a thirty six hundred liter spirit still. Um, we do. Uh, uh, I'm not at liberty to disclose the details of our cut, but suffice it to say, we do quite a narrow cut, and it's a very patient distillation because we're looking to maximise. Uh, uh, copper contact um, to really break down the big heavy congeners that are very rough and, and, and uh, take longer to, mat to mature out in the wood uh, to create a lighter, fruitier spirit. So you're running it low and slow? Correct. <laughs>
And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, I'll let you try some of the new make a wee bit later on. If we've still got some uh, sitting in the spirit receiver there, we'll pour a wee bit and let you try it. Okay. Do you have room to expand if you decided to down the road, five, ten years down the road, if uh, demand hits? Um, I, I'm kind of hoping that that might come sooner rather than later. Um, uh, call me naive, right? I mean, uh, we're really chuffed. Uh, chuffed is a Scottish term, maybe. We're really super excited um, um, about the quality of the spirit and the prospects for how it will grow in the marketplace. And so we will be laying down a lot more whiskey as we talked about earlier, a uh, spirit as we talked about earlier. But in addition to that, um, we've actually just started um, a, a, a campaign, a promotional campaign um, to put out contract manufacturing of whiskey. Because in two previous lives, I actually did contract fermentation. And I really perceive, akin to the craft beer market, that the craft whiskey market, a lot of people want to get into craft distilling, but they can't afford the capex, the capital expenditures. Or in order to raise that money, they need maybe to have some initial product to convince people they can make something good. Um, or maybe to generate some revenues. So we're actually going to be offering up some contract distillation um, for different, different styles of whiskey. So we might outgrow this capacity sooner rather than later. And as you can see in the floor plan here, I mean, this, this is about 8,000 square feet in here. Um, and you can see that we've actually got ample room, if we ever have to, to be able to put in an additional pair of, of pot stills and add more fermenters and washbacks um, across the back wall. Where the uh, bottling equipment is now. Yeah, and the bottling equipment can easily be moved out. And you may, you may notice the lacquered floor um, underneath those big tanks. That represents a, an eight inch reinforced concrete pad to take the massive loads um, those big fermenters there are washbacks, probably, um, you know, they're 10,000 litres. So they probably weigh about 11 metric tonnes spread across four legs sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a heck of a weight point load. Um, and so that concrete pad goes all the way to the extent, uh, to the end there. And you certainly don't need it for a bottling line. Just bring that forward and you can put four more, five more of those big boys in there. And all of a sudden you've doubled your capacity. So as a production engineer from a past life with Pfizer and Lilly and Mike Nicholson having been with Diageo and our master brewer having worked with, with large scale brewing, we designed the facility for expansion with expansion in mind. We've talked before about your history. You came out of pharmaceuticals uh, with a background in fermentation, chemistry and that part of science. But as a Scotsman, you always wanted to have a distillery. Now you got one. It's been open for a year. Was it worth it? <laughs> it, it I'm absolutely exhausted. I, I, I burn the candle at both ends, uh, you know, because you're not just starting one business with the brewery, it's a second business. And then the tourism, which, you know, for me, I think tourism goes hand in hand with having a distillery. Um, and you have to really make sure it's a quality venture as well. Um, uh, that's three businesses that my wife and I and this very tight team of people here and Mike Nicholson and others um, are trying to manage. Is it worth it? Um, when, when connoisseurs, whether it's whiskey connoisseurs or beer connoisseurs come in here and they, they talk about the great tour they've had or they're excited to design a cask of whiskey or they've tasted their new make spirit and they're waxing lyrical about it, that keeps you going. That really keeps you going. So yes, it is worth it. Obviously, the Victoria Caledonian whiskies are still a few years away, but I can tell you this much. The new make spirit coming off the still is some of the best I've ever tasted. On a side note, Victoria Caledonian has been caught up to a smaller degree in the British Columbia liquor controversy, and it points out something that has not been widely noted. Because Graham McElhoney is also importing Scotch whiskey to sell as an independent bottler with his Twa Casks whiskies, Victoria Caledonian has to be licensed under British Columbia law as a commercial distiller instead of a craft distiller, which has to make all of its own products from locally grown grains. Now, the craft distillers are allowed to self-distribute to the province's bars and restaurants, while Victoria Caledonian is at the mercy of the provincial system's liquor buyers, if they don't choose to stock his whiskies in their stores, it's not available to B.C. bars and restaurants. 
That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, Isla's legendary single malt. Look for the classic Lagavulin 16 year old, the Lagavulin Distillers Edition, and the new Lagavulin 8 year old at a whiskey shop near you. And find out more about Lagavulin at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. It's probably obvious, as you might be able to tell from my voice, but I've been fighting a cold since I got back from Victoria this week. But I had the chance to taste that Victoria Caledonian 11-month-old Machna Breche single malt spirit before I headed out to Victoria. It's bottled at 50% ABV and matured in Dr. Jim Swan's specially treated red wine breaks that have been scraped, toasted, and recharred. The nose is fruity with notes of peaches, red apples, red grapes, a hint of brandy, muted spices, and a touch of molasses cookies with a nice balance. The taste is thick and chewy with good fruity notes at first. Then the spices come alive with clove, white pepper, and cardamom notes that last through the finish, which is medium length with those lingering spices and hints of tree fruits in the background. It's young but has a lot of promise for the future, and I'm scoring the Macnabraca Single Malt Spirit from Victoria Caledonian and 87. And no, I did not adjust on the points for the degree of difficulty in pronouncing the name. By the way, they are bottling new batches of it for sale at the distillery. The current version being served there is now about 13 months old. Now, one of the whiskeys that did very well in last week's Canadian Whiskey Awards was the Caribou Crossing Single Barrel from Sazerac. It's bottled at 40% ABV, and the nose is nice and sweet with tree fruits, vanilla, and a touch of marshmallow, while the taste has a great balance of peaches, citrus fruits, and subtle spices. The finish? It's nice and long. I'm scoring the Caribou Crossing Single Barrel a 92. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, the makers of Whiskey Advocate's 2017 Whiskey of the Year, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. This 12-year-old barrel-proof bourbon was pitted blind against competition from around the globe and was consistently ranked number one by the magazine's testers. Meet the whole Elijah Craig family at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. When I hear people complain about no-age statement single malts, as soon as I remind them of the Aberlauer Abuna, that's usually enough to quiet them down. Batch number 55 is the most recent bottling of Abuna, and it's bottled at a whopping 60.9% ABV. Despite that, it's very drinkable neat with a nose full of toffee, manuka honey, figs, dates, and muted spices. The taste is thick, chewy, oily, and yet still has some sweetness to it with touches of honey and ginger. Then the spices kick in with clove and white pepper. The finish is long, aromatic, and warm with gently fading spices and a touch of honey sweetness. Abuna gets better every time I taste it, And I'm scoring batch number 55 of Aberlauer Abuna, a 93. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,100 different whiskeys from around the world at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links to the latest episode of WhiskeyCast Virtual Tastings and our WhiskeyCast HD video podcasts, along with the latest whiskey news, events, and much, much more, including our list of whiskey clubs around the world and a complete archive of past episodes. Let's keep the cask strength conversation going all week long. You'll find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And my email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast. Brought to you by Redbreast. 
the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.